volunteers. Jeez. Great, thank you. All right, so I guess we're called to order here. First call, the Pledge of Allegiance. agenda item is public comments. So we do have someone here. Please, what do you want me to do? Uh, he's a consultant. Uh, oh. He's going to give a presentation on some peninsula signs. So. Okay, so we have no public comments. Right. Looks like. Okay. All right. So then we have approval of minutes of both the September and November meeting. My comment, I, I have to abstain because the November meeting, I was not in attendance. So do we have, I guess Jim's on the phone, so he can vote, right? So we have a quorum to vote even without my vote on that. Jim, can you uh, uh, hear Joseph? Yes, I can. Okay. I, can I vote in approval? Okay. I also abstain for the same reason. Oh. I was in person. And I vote. Approval. So we need a motion and a second, but okay. Second. Yeah. Okay. I second. Motion and a second and all approved. All approved. All approved. So Aye. Okay. All right, and yes. uh, for both sets of meetings, uh, applies to, or, or no, September meeting, we were all in attendance, so uh, we have a motion to approve that. Well, yeah. there was no meeting in November, so it's just the September Oh, November meeting, yes, I apologize. Okay, all right, great. Okay, all right, thank you. So now we move on to new business, and the first item is the Middlefield Class 2 bike lane project. Um, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay, if we can have the uh, consultant. Um, Mr. Yu Louch, Louch, for all the planning is here. Thank you. Uh, is this the same thing we received from Jennifer? No, it's different. Yeah, I think this, is, this may be different. This is different than new. Uh, yeah, two, two, two pieces of paper that I'm going to hand out um, that have a little bit of information right. for you. And then if you guys. Well, you have them already. If you're interested, um, yeah. as well. Thank you. Uh, can you email that to us so we can get them to Jim then too? Sure. Yeah. yeah. And Nadia, this is all I had on the email. Oh, yeah. You might not have the um, picture of the of the signs. That's just to yeah. Give I, I didn't have that. An image of what the signs um, look like. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm here. I work. Uh, my name is Hugh Louch. I work for Alto Planning and Design, um, and I've been helping a combination of city managers uh, from Menlo Park and Palo Alto, uh, Redwood City, and Mountain View, as well as joint venture Silicon Valley on a project that they call the Peninsula Bikeway. Um, and the concept is for a bikeway that kind of connects those uh, cities. You guys happen to sit right in the middle um, of that. Um, in the first instance, what they've done is identified uh, an interim route, um, and what they're trying to do is um, create signage, which is what the larger picture um, has on it. So it's a picture of a uh, potential sign uh, topper that would go on top of either street signs um, or um, existing or, or new wayfinding signs uh, that are out there, um, and that would allow uh, sort of a continuous bike route from uh, Redwood City all the way down through Mountain View. Um, and uh, the route itself currently kind of proposed route meanders a little bit um, just because there aren't kind of continuous existing uh, bike facilities that connect all of your communities. Um, and then long term, they also have a desire to kind of create uh, a more robust, um, you know, separated, um, higher quality bike route. But I'm really here just to talk to you guys about the interim route today. So um, the smaller piece of paper has a map of the proposed route through Atherton. Um, and a number of potential uh, sign locations. And again, this is just a topper. So if you had a street sign name, and I realize in a lot of instances you guys don't have uh, street signs, so it wouldn't always work, um, or some kind of wayfinding sign um, that exists already, it's a small sign that would sit on top of those um, existing signs. Um, we've identified about 10 locations um, in Atherton that we think uh, we'd like to have these signs included just so that as you're traveling throughout the route, um, you know, it's kind of continuous um, and regular uh, understanding of where the route is, and, you know, sort of the legibility of the route so that people know where they're supposed to turn and, and one thing and another. So um, ultimately, they are hoping to purchase and install the signs before Bike to Work Day, which will take place um, in May, um, as it does every year. 
um, and the hope is that um, the town will um, also be willing to contribute um, in the order of those 10 signs. There might also be um, a couple uh, new sign poles that are needed as well um, in order to facilitate um, some of this. So, uh, you know, there would be some cost associated with that, uh, but uh, they're currently working on a potential bulk purchase of the signs and, you know, wanted to make sure you were aware of it, um, wanted to find out if you were supportive and kind of have any conversation that you have about it. Is that everything? Well, that's, yes. And then okay. I'm here for so questions, I think. You, you, you've given us um, a, a, a fold out that says um, pavement marking. Yeah, so we also identified, um, especially for Redwood City, because the route is pretty circuitous in Redwood City, um, something that they might put on the ground as a, to indicate where the route turns. Um, they are debating implementing that and, and may or may not implement that. Um, that's just um, something that if a city was interested in putting something like that on the ground, they would, um, you would do so, you know, just with regular kind of um, public works crews and things like that. It's not something that's going to be implemented consistently in the corridor. Just the signs will be consistent throughout the cities. This is the route proposed for Atherton, and you're describing Redwood City as circuitous? <laughs> yes, you, you, as circuitous as that looks, and it's not that bad. You know, it, it turns a couple times. It's not that bad. Uh, the, in Redwood City, it, uh, because there's so many streets where there's a jog uh, uh, on either street that it's really challenging. So it kind of goes up and down and around a little bit. It has to get across um, Woodside Road, you know, um, Highway 84, and some other kinds of challenges like that. So quite a few. What's the meaning of the green versus yellow again? Versus yellow. On this? Can I help get this? Sure. Sure. Oh, well, the green is where it changes to uh, Menlo Park. So okay. the yellow is an Atherton, and then you know, once you're on uh, so Valparaiso, so you're in and, and, yellow, and, and blue and Menlo Park. <coughs> so it's coming up Oak Grove, and then it goes up Valparaiso, and then it goes on the park to go wing up all the way over. Exactly. Yep, that's right. And once it goes back, where it seems to end at Oakwood and Selby, is it, then it goes into Redwood City, and that's where it's switching? That's correct, yeah. At that point, it goes into um, into Redwood City. Is there any plan to add pavement marking in the town of Atherton? Uh, not that I'm aware of. And, you know, the Cheryls that were, are out there now, they there's a number of people that don't care for those the way they were installed right. either. So uh, I can't see uh, many people... And, and these are these seem like they're Cheryls to me. And I was going to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. They're just they just have more thermal plastic to it. Go ahead, uh, and ask the question. So the, so yeah, how come we're not you don't use Cheryls versus this kind of symbol? And also, I'm gonna have a multiple few questions. Sure. Out. So we'll, yeah, starting with that. Um, so the the notion with this um, is that it, with that. Uh, um, Marking is that it, it provides a little bit more direction, especially for route turns. So a Shero, you know, bicycle, the, the two arrows um, on top, uh, make it a little bit more challenging uh, to indicate turns um, of a route. Um, some cities have modified those to do that, but you're not supposed to. Uh, well, we've to do done that, that here. Yeah. So oh, we have done some of the Shero's with the arrows kind right. of off to the side. So, you know, if you were interested in doing that, you could just do that. This is essentially an alternate that you yeah. could use if you wanted to. It's, so, it, again, it's not really meant for anything beyond just as an option that right. cities could use. And as far as timing, when is the timing, when, is, when are, you think this will happen? If the community accepts this, mm -hmm. uh, what's the timing for this and who funds this? Um, so if the community accepts it, um, the... Um, Timing, as I say, is to get it implemented before Bike to Work Day, so ideally by April, because um, Bike to Work Day is sort of mid-May, um, and so that's the hope, is that's when it'll be complete. Um, the other cities are planning to start purchasing the signs in the next um, month, I would say, uh, approximately. So the so. city has to uh, purchase their own signs? And the, and the idea is that this, each of the cities would purchase their own signs. The, the other cities have gotten together and talked about doing a bulk purchase, um, and at this point, I think they're willing to sort of pre-purchase the 10 signs, um, if that's what it takes, and then, because we know it, there's a couple different committees this needs to go through um, in the town of Atherton, and then they would hope to be uh, reimbursed for that. I'm just, I guess, can I go back to, the, what is the purpose of this? Because yeah, that's a good question. the people I know who are 
serious bikers mm -hmm. would never follow this route. It's just way too out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and this feels like more of a route like you might send your kids on to avoid bad traffic. But sure. So I, I guess I'm trying to get what the what the high level who we expect to use it and what we're creating. Yeah, I think you're on, on to the exact um, notion there, which is that this isn't um, a route that's been developed and designed uh, with that the concept of your most sort of fearless bicyclist in mind, um, you know, who'd be willing to use more direct and more heavily um, traveled routes by automobiles. It's really meant for um, your, your children, you know, people who are a little bit more um, uh, concerned about traffic or about speed um, and things like that. And really, the idea kind of emerged uh, from a plan that uh, Joint Venture Silicon Valley had put together. They talked about the need to have a connection, you know, better bicycle connections across communities in Silicon Valley um, and, and in the peninsula. And what they wanted uh, to do uh, was to start to identify, was that possible? So the first step was to look at, could you create, uh, you know, and in the, in these four cities kind of stepped up to say, what if we tried to just create a route in our communities without doing anything new, right, without building any new infrastructure. And the result was a pretty circuitous route. Um, so part of the, uh, the notion there was to sort of um, start with that route as an interim sort of first step and then look to the future about how could you create a better, more direct, more continuous uh, route uh, that would connect all of these cities together. Like what they've done in Palo Alto where they built the path along the train tracks? Yeah, for example, it could be something like that, or even, you know, the kind of bike boulevards that they're doing in, in Palo Alto with, you know, significant traffic calming and, and diverters and one thing and another um, would be options. Or, you know, uh, there has been conversation, which I, I know you all are aware of, because I think it's on your agenda tonight to talk about, you know, separated bikeways on, on various facilities like El Camino Real or, or you know, other um, roads. Uh, like middle field, for example. So there are a variety of options uh, that would be considered for a, a longer term uh, route. But the notion was kind of to put together this first route as a way of like, what? How would you travel if you were trying to, if you were a kid, if you trying to get through these cities, or if you were, you know, someone who was committing to work, but they weren't that fearless, you know, spandex wearing bicyclist. So I, I see some value in this for organized uh, bike events. I live near the Alameda, and we get you know, two or three hundred bicyclists at a time coming through some organized event. And when you have two or three hundred bicyclists contending with a very heavily traveled artery, yeah. it causes real problems. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, Chief, do you, do we, does the town permit bicycle events? I guess not that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, I would I would encourage you know organized events to use this mm -hmm. this route. That'd be great. Yeah, I, I, I just you know it maybe comes down to what you're spending or where the money is coming from. But when we're we're scrambling for money to build the right bike lanes on middle fields, mm -hmm. I, I, I you know other than saying we now have a route that runs the length of the peninsula, I, I'm a little nervous about spending any kind of money on this. Yeah. So that's to do something where I'm not sure who would ever follow, really follow the route. So the, the and just uh, since you mentioned cost, the, um, the cost of the science is relatively minimal compared to anything else. That's, that's why that approach has been taken. And I don't have exact cost numbers um, in, in front of me, but you know, this is for 10 signs, uh, you know, and, and you may have a, a better sense of what, you know, the town would be paying for, for that kind of thing, but it's, it's not a lot of money to put in the, the signage. And that's kind of why, you know, this approach has been taken. Because a bigger, you know, a more significant bike facility will cost a lot, frankly. Um, and, and all of you have competing needs and interests and, and, and other issues and concerns. So. The one concern that I think should be pointed out is the material that the pavement markings are made of. Mm -hmm. the, the pavement markings that we have recently applied in the town of Atherton are a safety hazard. They uh, do not have adequate traction when mm. dry, and they're particularly hazardous when wet. So I would encourage you to look at alternatives for the pavement markings sure. that have a reasonable coefficient of friction. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Certainly, if you were if you were to put any new pavement markings in, you'd, you'd want to have um, them meet um, California 
and UTCD standards and, and so and thermoplastic okay. TYP I'm I'm not sure meets that criteria you just said. So it, it, it can. It sounds like, <laughs> but at least the proposal here that's being proposed by Atherton is is just the size. The ten sign toppers that are outside of the pool. Exactly. Yeah, we we aren't actually proposing any pavement markings. That that's sort of optional. And and again, you know, uh, you already asked. You know, you could just use a Shero there if you prefer. You could also do something totally different. This is an option that some cities are interested in, so it's there. We aren't actually proposing that um, to you today, just the signs, but you're just getting part of the full package. So forgive me because I came in late and I apologize. No um, problem. How, however, just a quick question, where, where are we going? This is a bike way, going from where to where? Where will this connect that? Right, so the party is it, the <coughs> idea is that this is going to connect Redwood City, um, you, uh, Menlo Park, um, uh, Palo Alto and Mountain View right now. That's, those are the cities that have been sort of working together to help design and come up with this concept um, and along with uh, Joint Venture Silicon Valley is also um, involved in it. So uh, we've right now... We, we've got Mountain View essentially on a, on a continuous path here. Right, that's, yeah. that's the idea. Mm -hmm. And you're saying this is at the city manager right. level? Or, or? And the city managers are, are all involved um, um, in this and having a conversation about it. I know the town city manager has been in contact with Russ and Joint Venture at Silicon Valley to talk about this um, in the past. So, Marty, what, what, so is this just informational to us? Is yes. Yes. And is it fit, so you get feedback from the. Yeah, any feedback that you have, any concerns about the specifics of. Um, either the route or, um, in particular, kind of the sign location. So all those little markers show you where the signs are proposed to be. Typically, when we do wayfinding type projects like this, I, I, I'd like want... to share some thoughts. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, sorry, it's a it's a little choppy. Um, you know, I I don't favor more signage. I think uh, you know. We kind of suffer from uh, too many already, uh, and I think we, we did not have great experience with the thermoplastic uh, markings, uh, so I would favor painted markings, and uh, I think we accomplished the same things with pavement markings uh, without signs. Jim, are you thinking that the only signs being proposed are pavement signs? You know, I'm afraid I, I'm having a little trouble hearing uh, if following the conversation. Uh, I, I don't know if, a, if it's a combination that's proposed, but uh, I, I don't favor more signage. I, I think we, we might so have the, a little more than we need already. If I understand the proposal correctly, it's not to have, a, in Atherton, not to have any pavement signage, but to have some signs that sit on top of the existing street signs. There are some new poles, though, I think. There are, there are a couple of places where there is no pole and you would need a new pole. Yeah. As much as, so, so, and just to, uh, and I think this may partly address your uh, comment. Um, uh, um, so the, in, in wayfinding, we typically, when we want for bicyclists to have them sort of find a continuous route, we typically recommend every two to three blocks that they see some kind of wayfinding sign that so they understand that they are on that route as you're biking along. You know, if it's not regular enough, then you don't know the route has disappeared for you, right? You don't know if it's turned or, or not. So we've tried to set the signage up so that uh, about every two to three blocks. Um, in Atherton, uh, we know that you don't have a lot of street signs, and you probably want to keep that to a minimum. So we've really tried to do the fewest number of signs possible, um, we think, to make the route legible uh, to folks. And to the greatest extent possible, we've tried to use only locations where you have existing uh, street signs, but there are a couple where you would need a new uh, pole, potentially. Um, some of the complicated turn around um, Elena, where Elena kind of, I think, comes along and and does a jog there, but it, that's sort of the typical route. Um, so maybe it wouldn't be it wouldn't be terrible. You might be able to do that with fewer. And I guess that's kind of what we'd look for you all to let us know, you know, as residents and as um, you know, folks really paying attention uh, to how people travel through the town, is to understand um, those movements through 
um, the streets and, and how they work. Um, so you know, if you have kind of comments and thoughts about that, we'd love to we'd love to get those. But we've essentially tried to pick out just the fewest possible number of sign locations so that one, it has sort of minimal cost um, to the town, and also so that um, you know it doesn't uh, sort of change the visual character uh, that you have now. So it's ten sign toppers on both. Road signs we have that you would put these on top of. Yeah, and you'll notice on that table it lists in every case where there is an existing, it should tell you what the existing yeah. um, sign is. So, and those haven't been field verified, but they, but we did use Google Street View to kind of look through and, and find all of those. So one kind of this seems to overlap at least in part with perhaps the school. Mm -hmm. um, was that one of the goals to try to do that, or is that is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think it would be a good thing, a good thing. If, it's, if it's falling where it can, especially as Collins designed, you know, for kids and families to get right. used to that route. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and, it, and it was intentional. Um, I wasn't directly involved in all the route design uh, part of it, but, the, but as I understand it, the uh, goal was really to create this continuous route um, and using, you know, existing known bike routes. Um, but in some cases, it might have to go on streets that didn't have one because, you know, it, to connect to other parts. But other than that, they were really trying to get it onto um, existing bike routes. Other questions that you have for me or things I can answer? So I think we're going to, you're going to be going to the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Yep. I think you're going to be on that agenda. Early, I think sometime this month or later on. Yes, that's my right? understanding. It's okay. either this month or next. Right. Uh, yeah, or early okay. next week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the next step would be to go to city council. Right. And city council decide whether they want to do these signs or not. So. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. And you can you uh, email us that present that again? I certainly will. I'll make sure you have uh, yeah. copies of that. And then we'll email it to uh, all the committee and, and Jim, you'll get it. We'll, I'll send it to your email also. Excellent. Have a good Great. Day. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure why that didn't make it on. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll follow up. Yeah. With Jennifer. Yeah. And all the time, I'm just really not supposed to talk about things that we've already done. So. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I will note that, that it was not an action item, right? Right. right. It's, it's just, just information. It almost could be considered a public comment. Right. If that's the case. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. All right. So, 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 you want to move on to the cost of bike lane? Sure. Uh, Acting Chair Davis. Um, that's for me, and what a thing. Sure. So, um, one of the things I don't have a formal presentation because I actually just got this plan set this morning, and it's here for the Middlefield Class Two bike lanes. This went to council a couple months ago. I think it was in uh, November, and the council provided uh, some feedback to staff about some of the changes they wanted to have with the Class Two bike lanes on Middlefield between like Jennings and Ravenswood. Mm -hmm. And then in between, um, you might uh, recall that the parcel tax was voted down by the community. So that impacted this project also. Which parcel tax was voted down by the community? Um, so we had, we had a measure F that was voted on, um, right, it seems like a long time ago now, but it was. Yeah, right, in November. In November, yeah, right. And Proposition F. It, 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 so it meant that after, I believe, 2020, uh, we'll no longer be receiving the parcel tax revenue. So was it project. was Proposition F defeated? It was it was defeated. Pat, it, it received a little under fifty three percent of the vote required. Uh, uh, Sixty six. So the local paper said it was approved, but they didn't understand. They just said the fifty three percent. Yeah. And he did two thirds majority. Thank you for the clarification. Right. I didn't understand. So that. We, we're out by one point eight million dollars a year, approximately, uh, that we the, the source revenue that we've had. Uh, uh, starting twenty twenty. 
I, we've got it for the next couple of years, I believe. Yeah. So, and then the disappeared. might be 2019, I think. First. I, I think 2018 is the last year. Yeah. Yeah. So, so starting 2019, it's one more year. Next 2019 is when it starts. Um, and so we tried to extend out some of some projects that are planned. We've extended out. Um, just one of the other things that will be of interest to this committee, we looked at uh, extending the length of time between repaving roads to try to save some money. Um, so things like that to try to stretch the dollar a little further. And the parcel tax provided $1.4 million for the CIP for public works projects, and then 400000 went to police for officers and so on. And so after, I think, believe it's this year, that money goes away. And so we're already now, this impacts this project. And so when we brought this to council in November, they asked us to look at maybe segmenting the project. Uh, so uh, based on the available funding we do have, that maybe we'd do parts of the project and not the whole thing, again, because of the funding is not there. Uh, so I have these plans here that are 65% complete, and what we'll do is we'll email them to the committee members so you have that, and if you have any comments, feedback, certainly send them back to me. It's just that I just got them again, like I said, this morning. And we are bringing this to council um, in February uh, for comments uh, to ask them the council before we move any further we want to make sure we're in line with the council's expectations for this project and how we're you know, separating uh, sections of this out and so that's going to be happening next month uh, so but right now we're moving forward with the project based on the last council direction we got because we want to actually uh, have this installed this summer when school is in, uh, in summer recess so we have a small window, I think it's like six weeks to get this project done. So the timeline is pretty, so moving pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. We, lost, we lost two hundred seconds. We started seconds. segmenting it, my member of the council meeting, which is a little up, is what we ended up doing was focusing on a, a safe route to school to make sure that part was done, is that right. correct? Correct, from Marsh to Ravenswood, and then the other section would be Ravenswood for Jennings North, and so that's what the consultants were doing between uh, the last council meeting and really today from the, the, when I got those reports today. So, so the idea is that the, the focus will be to get that done, the, the really the safe route okay. school portion of it, and then I guess Jennings and Marsh and what's on the other end is just is essentially postponed until the end of March to do it. So does council want input from this committee? Yes, yes that's so why it's here. How should we give input by email? Uh, by me. Okay. So, so I mean, basically, by your oral comment. So my my yeah. my position is really simple. I think it's a great idea, but whatever markings you put on the road, please make sure that they're safe and that they don't cause accidents and have kids sliding off into cars. Right. Yeah, and we had heard that a number of times at the, from the council members also. So. Good. Yeah. I would say and I'll, almost. And I'll stop saying it. it, 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 it no, probably the three most common things I hear about are the train. The airplanes and that damn thermoplasty that everybody <laughs> <laughs> talks about. Right. Yeah. Right. And how much does it reduce the width available for automobiles? We're we're, not, we're actually not going to actually parts. There's parts we're going to have to have PG&E move their poles, and we're going to be widening the road a little bit in certain sections. Um, but there's like the two or three sections only that we're going to be doing that. So the travel lanes are going to pretty much stay about I think it's ten and a half, eleven foot width. And so we'd be widening the bike lanes in certain areas about a foot or so, and then moving the poles over to. So there is one other comment I have, and this is directed towards the chief. When we have bike lanes, it would be helpful if your officers could encourage bicyclists to stay in the bike lanes, not to be cruising out in front of cars and causing people to slam on their brakes or drive into the opposite lane and just getting into the yeah, we do monitor that when we can because a uh, recent analysis of the bike collisions in town in the last year, there's a fair amount that are caused by the bicyclists. And so we do monitor that and we do stop them and some are ticketed as well. So. Thank you. And just one other aside on, on, on Measure F to, to keep in mind. It sounds like a very small amount of money, 1.4 plus you know, $1.8 million or so. Uh, it's a little over 13% of the total revenue for the town. So it does affect projects. Right. So I, I think the, um, the general answer to that is, is we're unlikely, I think, to, to do that. And the answer, the reason for that is um, we
we, we've got a couple of other things coming that have to be voted on that, that would affect revenue stuff. We don't want to mix, mix and match too much. So we actually are considering it, but there's very little support in the council to, to go back and, and push it. Um, although at the same time, we're looking at some other things, like for example, a, a, a change to our business license tax, which would require a vote. So Jen, to recap, I'll be, we'll email this to you. You'll get it from Jennifer. And then if you have any comments, certainly uh, send us, uh, send it to me or the police chief or whatever. So. Jim, you got any questions on the phone? Well, I do have one other question on this. Have you yeah. factored in the all of the new plans there, around Las Lomitas nice. School? Got it. Uh, I'm not sure what plan, what, what plans you're referring to. Well, Las Lomitas School is building a new parking lot. They're proposing putting in a stoplight at Walsh Road and uh, Alameda de las Pulgas. Um, they're proposing a whole new oh, way to yeah. drop off. Well, the this is the middle field. This this is the middle field. No, but, but this impacts the, the, the kids. Of the not not safe over here. Route to schools. I'm sorry, I thought this all was wrapped up with the safe route to no, this is for the middle field class two bike lanes. Just for the ME. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. But the, isn't there a separate thing for self safe routes to schools? No. For bike, a bike? Not that I'm. Involved. Didn't we just talk about that? Yeah, we, I mean, we have a, one of our policies in town is to focus on a bike paths on, on safe routes to school, or so we prioritize them. This middle field is an example of that because we're going right around MA. Right. To provide, yeah. Right. But. Has, has that plan been updated to recognize the, the work being done at Las Lomitas? Uh, I'm not sure how that would affect it, because I'm, I'm very well what's going on over there at the school. I'm, and it has bike lanes over there already. So I'm in there, they're looking at putting a traffic signal there at Walsh to help the kids cross there. Uh, so I'm not sure. But, but as long as you're aware of it and you're thinking oh, about absolutely. it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, then I, that's yeah. what, that was my only question. Yeah, we're working with the school on that project, so we know what's going on. Okay. Can you ask Jim? Jim, is he there? Yes. Any uh, okay. comments or questions about the Middlefield Class 2 bike lane project? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. All right, so move on. Again, you'll be getting that email to you, the plan set. 
and that's going on February 17th to City Council for further directions. Okay, great. Thank you. Selby Lane? Yeah, Selby Lane ECR. Um, the town and uh, the consultants had a third community meeting at Selby Lane Elementary School on December 4th to provide to get input and feedback about uh, how to make that intersection safer. Because over the last 10 years, there have been, I think, 60 some uh, collisions there. And and everybody feels, you know, PD can certainly speak to this better than I can, that there's safety concerns there. And so, the consultants have looked at a number of options about what to do there, and one was to signalize the intersection. And so the community, you know, waited on that. And not this meeting, but the meeting before, they put dots and see you know, which one they, they uh, like better, or restrict certain movements, turn movements in and out of uh, Selby or ECR to address some of these right turn collisions. And I don't know if the sergeant or the chief mm -hmm. want to speak to that because. Uh, they, they're well aware of the collision history there better than I am. Um, and so we had a community meeting, these, these options were presented, and certainly there's always the do nothing option, leave everything the way it is. Um, but I'm not sure if that's, ultimately the city council will decide what they want to do out there. And so this report is actually going to city council on uh, January 17th, so uh, in about a week or so, council's going to hear this presentation and then provide staff with direction of what they want to do out there at that location. So, I don't know, do either one of you want to add anything to well, that? I don't remember the option, but I know that <clears throat> I attended the meeting. It was very well attended, um, right. very vocal, somewhat emotional, but the overall, I think, support was for option two, and I don't remember call what that was. It was not a signal. So yeah, it was, it was restricting, certain, restricting some turn movements, right. right, with some medians and things like that to, to restrict, some, like a left turn out of Selby heading north on ECR. Um, that would be one that would get restricted, you know, potentially. So. Is, it, is, this, is this a pedestrian issue or more of a vehicle collision incident challenge? Um, so it's actually more of a, of, a, of a vehicle collision challenge there. I mean, there are kids that, that cross El Camino that live um, east of El Camino, um, but most of the crashes there occur from left-hand turn violations and right-hand turns from Selby Lane. Uh, basically right away people cutting people off and turn in front of others is what most of our collisions are there there are a few rear end collisions um, and there have been you know one or two bicycle in the crosswalk collisions but a majority of those 60 collisions are all right away violations by motorists yeah. and our, our big concern and luckily it has not happened is the number of kids that cross there in the morning and the afternoon if you haven't observed it you know if you stop and talk with the crossing guard you know he's it's kind of like Frogger, you know, very precarious getting those kids across. So that's one of our major concerns, and I think this would uh, help mitigate that. Is there, I mean, there's only one block from Fifth Avenue, right? And isn't there a pedestrian, the light of the pedestrian crosswalk there as well? So there, there is a crosswalk at Fifth Avenue. The, the issue is to use that crosswalk. If you live over there by Jack in the Box, you have to actually cross Fifth Avenue then you have to cross El Camino, and then you have to walk on El Camino back to Selby. There's no sidewalk. It's basically on the shoulder of the road. Or they could go down to uh, Dumbarton, cross the light on Dumbarton, and then if they walked in El Camino, they'd be walking with their back against traffic. Or they could walk Dumbarton up to Oakwood, snake through that neighborhood, and then come up Selby that way. It's not pedestrian friendly. It is, yeah. yeah. Because, the, and because of the, the crosswalk at Fifth Avenue, only on the south side? It's only on the south side of the intersection, right? And the intersection there is pretty wide. It's, uh, the, the intersection is wide, yeah. and, um, and right. you know, we've had, we've had our fair share of pedestrian collisions at that intersection, too. Uh, people crossing on the crosswalk and, and people making the left-hand turn there from 5th on to uh, southbound El Camino. Every now and then we'll, we'll collide with a pedestrian inside the crosswalk. But, but it sounds like what's being proposed is some restrictions on like turning left. Yeah, that's one of the options, and then again, signalize the intersection and so on. So, and so that's going to council in about eight days now. So, how does it fit that in your I'm sorry, I, could, I, I think this would be more helpful if, if the committee had enough information to be able to provide some real input. Yeah, and I don't think we're getting that. Sort of my sense. Um, so I, I don't know how how we could better do that, but it'd be, it'd be helpful for the council to have clear committee input and. Uh, 
feel like the committee's not getting that information. Without knowing what the options are, it's hard right. to comment on any Well, of yeah. We, we can email you the, uh, the uh, presentation that was provided to the community on December 4th. We can send that along with the plans and then also the other presentation and send that out to you. How, how quickly do you need input? With this coming to the council? 17. Of, so in two weeks, or a week. Right, we eight, two weeks. Weeks. eight days, yeah, you're right. And, and the challenge here to let you know, it, it's not really simple because um, a lot of the residents have very strong opinions about traffic in their neighborhood and how it's affected. Um, there are, I believe in this case, that literally none of the students who go to school there are African residents. Um, we've talked to the school about you know, their responsibility and how it overlaps with the town's responsibility. It's really, it's, it's a fairly complex little situation. And also El Camino is the state road too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So California. So talking about that, right? You're going to city, right? Yeah. Yeah. And is that, the, is, is that literally, the, the, that is the corner of Atherton at Selby Lane and El Camino? Well, I mean, we is it once once uh, well, Atherton Atherton owns the southbound lanes of El Camino from uh, just south of Dumbarton all the way through, but we have none of the northbound lanes there. The northbound lanes all belong to San Mateo County. Sorry, Anthony, where's Dumbarton? Uh, Dumbarton is up where the Cafino is, the new uh, the new adult living center there across from the oil change place. So you have the county, you have Caltrans, and then the town. So, so, this, so north, north of Selby? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Dumbarton is north of Selby. It's Dumbarton on the east side and, and uh, Oakwood on the west. Yeah. So there's a, lot, a few jurisdictions involved right there. So without material and without discussion, how can we help you? Well, that's why I raised it. I'm not, yeah. sure. I'm not sure we're getting a lot of help. And not your call. Well, I, I, I mean, I'm happy to look at email and respond, right. but but I, without my the opinions and, and insight of my colleagues, I'm not sure that it would be as valuable as if we had a discussion. Mark, do you want to give a, a, a little bit more detail for you about the options? Um, I don't have any that, of that with me, so. so you can send the presentation. Then, Pardon? You, you would send us the presentation. Yeah, we'll send you a presentation. And again, it comes down to restricting some of the turn movements or a signal. And... And, and that's where we're at. And now, so where does the budget for the work come from? Who's supposed to pull me up? Well, that's that's another issue. Is who would pay for what, and does the county share the costs and all that? So that's that hasn't been decided yet or determined yet. So you know, first off, is you know what option does the council and the, then the county want to do, and then who funds it? So. One thing I can add to the discussion is I have noticed on Fifth Avenue and El Camino that the number of red light runners has gone up exponentially lately, both going straight ahead and turning left into from El Camino into Fifth Avenue, mm -hmm. southbound. And, and that's got to add more potential issues for, the, for pedestrians. I see people jumping out of the way all the time now. Going southbound on El Camino turning red, left against the red light on Fifth? Yeah, but you know, there's a left turn. There's a left. There's, there's a left turn light, and that light turns red, and people are still turning. Okay, light. so they're they're like they're kind of traveling this way. And and pedestrians, of course, in the crosswalk, and everybody's jumped out of the way, and it's it's not a good intersection at all. Well, it's going to get worse. There's a lot of construction going on in the city. Yeah, and not far from. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll send you send that you information. So. Thank you, Mark. Any other comments on this, questions? Jim? No, thank you. Okay. All right, moving on to regular business. Selby Lane, walk, bike, audit, field review. Um, that was, we've done that before. But that was done in September. That was at one presentation, I think. Yeah, I don't anything more. I participated in that, but yeah. it was just a, it was looking at an extension from uh, the Selby Lane ECR crosswalk, getting the students to the school. It's kind of a, an overall encompassing project, using transit more, uh, making sure that the shoulders are clear best we can. There's a problem with cars and garbage cans. Um, I don't know the result of that, Marty. 
Yeah, I haven't seen any final reports on that either. Um, county's lead on that one. Okay. I, I, so like you said, it's the weirdest schools in our district, but, the, but there's no students. Involved. It's, it's an interesting situation. Yeah. 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 Do we have liability issues in this? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm sure if people, anybody would walk on our streets. Yeah, and again, we've had no child, you know, pedestrian car right. or bike incidents along there. Right. Any further comment? Overview of ECR Complete Street Project. Anything updated on that material? Uh, no, we just um, had another meeting with Menlo Fire uh, right around the holidays to get their feedback on some of the options. Um, and we're going to be coming back to council, uh, I believe, sometime in uh, either February or March to get further direction. But this is another project that's going to probably uh, not go any further because of the parcel tax not, not being approved. So uh, right now we're, we're, we're completing phase one, which the con consultants uh, provided a few options. To you that looked at adding bike lanes or emergency vehicle uh, lanes, uh, and then we met with Caltrans and then CCAG staff, um, and so really have there's really been nothing more than that at this point. It's a pretty slow moving train, anyway. Right? Right. Essentially, would require I think logically require regular, at least for us regular city actors at Menlo Park to have some common vision of what El Camino is yeah. going to be, right? Because yeah. otherwise. It's kind of silly. It's, it, we have two lanes here and three lanes here, and a bike lane here, and not there. So it's been a, it's been a slow mover for a long time. Yeah. Right. So there's really nothing new on that one. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the two layer. Can Can I ask about the the these? I don't even know the name for the lights nowadays. These the options. 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 They're called beacons. Okay, the beacon lights on El Camino. What's this? Where are we with that? They're up and running. All of them are up. There's Correct. No we have three in the town limits, and they're all running, up and running. So, and, and, there, and there's no plan and no alternative to use one of those on Selby? Um, no, not to my knowledge. And that wasn't one of the alternatives that was presented? It might have been early on, but um, I, I don't know what happened to that. That's why I asked the question. Is this a, is this a pedestrian problem or a vehicle? Right. And we heard it was mostly car accidents, right. so the vehicle's not going to help. Right, exactly. Also, we, we've only put forward, we paid for one of the hot beacons, and really, even that was for a special deal. Um, the state, Caltrans, is responsible for the operation of El Camino and responsible for lights on El Camino. Yeah, Menlo Fire shared a cost with Almondral, with the town. The other two are funded by Caltrans. But are there any news on how often they're used? I know it's not very often. I've actually this past weekend I've seen them I've seen them all light up at least twice. This well, past I'm sure Menlo Park over there uh, that one gets used a lot. Almond on on uh, Almond Draw or or by Menlo College. By Menlo so College, yeah. Yeah, Menlo oh. College I've seen light up probably right. more than the others. But right. Isabella was on um, this right. weekend and so was Almond Draw. We are able to get that data apparently. I know it's been checked <clears throat> at Almond Draw wasn't used very much. Um, and then right now we're going through a learning curve with those. If you've seen them. Um, the traffic, it takes a while. I've been familiar from Washington. We got some information out in our local Athetonian, and we've been working with Caltrans to get some better signage that I'm used to from Washington, but they're not entertaining it right now. But there is a lot of confusion, especially when it starts to go to flash, which means you can go, and most people don't know that. Um, and we've had one or two accidents probably contributed to that. Of course, the person wasn't paying attention and rear ended, but um, so it's just it's a learning curve like roundabouts and anything else new. Uh, hopefully, it will become the norm. The chief, I've noticed uh, a couple of times a pedestrian stuck in the uh, at the median when it goes to Flushing Lake, and then there's like total confusion. The pedestrian doesn't know what to do. Right. The traffic doesn't know what to do. Right. The intent is that if it's occupied and it's flashing, you don't go, but that's not clear. And we did work with Caltrans, and I think they did it compliant with Almondral to give the pedestrian more time on right. the solid red. But then the problem with that is 
normal cadet students, when they're paying attention, they get right across, and traffic is stopped for a period of time, which creates its other problems. So. Which sort of defeats the purpose of the beach. Exactly. Right? <laughs> I also mentioned sometimes you push the button, and the, the wait is so long that the street actually empties out, and you see people crossing because <laughs> it's now safe to cross. But it, it actually, then they're gone, and then the light comes on. It, it could be. It's actually know, set up that way to get the brakes in the traffic on El Camino to do that. That that's how it's set it's up. Time. Actually. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I did. It can go a long way. Though. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I did see a kid. I wasn't aware of that. And I did see a kid by the college push it. I was stopped at a, on side street, and he pushed it again. He pushed it again. The kid that was, and I'm going, I wonder why is it activated? So I didn't know that. There's advanced loops that it it, it, it will trigger if there's it ha it's waiting for a certain gap in traffic, and once that gap is, then it, then it'll go on. If not, that gap it, you'll, you can wait for a while. Until there's a gap but there's no sign there indicating or telling anybody that's what's going to happen. Oh, right. So, anyway. So, so all these advancements in autonomous car, you hope at some point we'd be able to actually have these things come on for the length of time somebody's actually in the street as opposed to yeah. just having a fixed set of time. I do think it's a very good thing. People, because they go all the way now on uh, the right of the city to see them, and, and people, I, I think people should be slowing down and acting. Just these, even if they never went on, just the fact that they're there, that yeah. hopefully people are slowing down a little bit. So it's, it's new and people will learn. Yeah. Learn so behavior. just data points. There is a regular light on the Alameda near Las Lomitas. It's not in the town of Atherton. It's just a half a block outside of the town of Atherton. You push the button, the lights change. People cross, the lights turn off, cars stop, everybody knows what to do. It works. I don't know what the difference in cost for that system is versus the beacons, but as a data point, that one really works and it's worked for a number of years. Yeah, but it's also a two-lane road versus trying not to manage a six-lane road. Right. right. It's, it, it's, it, you're right. There's yeah. lots of differences. Well, that's the one they're moving to, right? That's the light that's being moved one block down. The well, it's actually they're going to take that out, that pedestrian mm -hmm. signal that he's referring to, and put a full signal at Walsh and the new driveway that they're putting in there. Yeah. Mm. So now they will delay because it's a regular intersection. So now when they push the button, it changes so quickly. <laughs> all right. Anything else on the ECR thing? No. No. Nope. All right. Then move to the staff reports. For the chapters of September. Okay, so there's um, there's four of them. I'll just go through them. Uh, for September, we received eight traffic complaints. Uh, two, DR, two DUI arrests were made for September. They were not the result of traffic collisions. Um, we had 10 traffic collisions, uh, three involved injuries, three were hit and run, <coughs> and none were caused by anybody who was driving under the influence. And two of those happened during the morning commute, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., and four during the afternoon commute, 3 p.m. to 7 p.m and we had 365 traffic stops in September. Uh, moving on to October. How many of those stops resulted in this year's report? How many resulted in citations versus? There were 139 citations issued in September. I think he's asking for the collisions. No, no, is that, I don't know, oh. out of those 365 100, stops resulted in. Oh, okay. 139, right. No, we, you know, we never even, uh, we never even used to put the day of the time in the week. That's something new that we started a couple years ago, but we've never, we've never put the date down. All right, moving on to October. Uh, we had four traffic collisions during the month of October. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, we had four traffic complaints during the month of October. One arrest was made for driving under the influence during October, and that resulted from a traffic collision. Uh, we had 16 collisions in October, seven involved injuries, two were hit and runs, and two involved a driver who was under the influence. 
And um, I will mention that on this one, the numbers don't add up because if you look at the monthly DUI report, there was only one arrest made, um, yet two collisions were caused by DUI. And um, the other one, the reason why it doesn't show two DUI arrests is that one of those collisions was actually one of our officers was involved um, in a collision on El Camino and the person that she was involved in the collision with actually caused the collision and that person um, was under the influence. So the CHP came out and took that case and because they took the case, they made the arrest on that. So that's why those numbers don't add up on that one. So someone was drinking and rear-ended a police car? No, he was in a, okay. he was in a motorized, riding a motorized scooter under the influence, crossed six lanes of El Camino and ended up directly in the path of police car and he got hit yeah he's a he's a known person to drive erratically in his motorized scooter. Yeah. Um, we actually had video of him from in the other area yeah, we had video of him on a willow road that was taken from a menlo fire truck of him zigzagging in and out of traffic on willow road so and uh, and the officer I, quite frankly she responded very quickly for what was happening right in front of her. He did sustain some pretty serious injuries, but uh, is, you know, on the mend now, yeah. per se. Some people have that picture. <laughs> uh, five of those collisions occurred during the morning commute period and four during the afternoon. There were 367 traffic stops and 115 um, of those were citations. There was another one, the collision number 12, Yes, that was the officers were out at a collision at that intersection and one of the police cars was parked blocking traffic and somebody who was traveling northbound on El Camino got too close to the police car and took the mirror off the door. So Menlo Park Police came out and took that report for us. Moving on to November, we had uh, five traffic complaints during the month of November. One arrest was made for driving under the influence and it was not the result of a traffic collision. We had nine collisions, four involved injuries, none were hit and runs and none involved anybody under the influence. Two occurred during the morning commute period and none occurred during the afternoon commute period. 383 total traffic stops and 104 of those were citations. And moving on to last month, December, we had. There's one. There's one on this report for November about someone complaining about an MA, MA pickup, somebody using their driveway. I remember a year ago or so this year we changed some signage because there were a lot of people complaining about people parking in the neighborhood just west of MA for pickup, and we changed the signs from no parking to no stopping. And so it seemed like is that issue kind of. Yeah, we don't hear it. So that was on Rebecca, and we don't hear much about Rebecca anymore. Um, this one here was on Oak Grove Avenue, so just right outside the entrance to MA. Um, but Rebecca's been, been fairly quiet now that the signs have been put up. So, okay, moving on to December. We had four traffic complaints in December. Uh, one arrest was made for driving under the influence, not the result of a traffic collision. 18 collisions during December, five involved injuries, three were hit and runs, and none involved anybody who was driving under the influence. Uh, three occurred during the morning commute period, nine occurred during the afternoon commute period. We had 455 traffic stops and 112 of those resulted in citations. My wife, my boss, gave me a, a task uh, for tonight. She asked me to ask you about the experience with automobile break-ins. She's been reading about a lot of, uh, you know, break the glass and grab kinds of things going on in Redwood City and Menlo Park in Palo Alto. And she asked me to ask you what the experience has been in Athens. So, um, does it happen? Yes, it happens. Um, a lot of times the reason it happens is because people leave stuff visible in their car. So they're leaving their purses, their laptops, 
their electronic toys, the whole thing. So what I tell people is that when you leave your car, the only thing they should see inside your car is four seats and four floor mats. If they see anything other than four seats and four floor mats, anything of value, you're risking having somebody smash your window and reach in and take your stuff. Um, the other issue we have in town is people who simply don't lock up their cars. So they won't lock their cars, they'll keep their windows rolled down on the street, um, people will go through and rifle through their cars, they'll go into the glove compartment, they'll take what they want, they'll take what they want out of the vehicle. Um, and then we have some people in town too who will park their cars in their driveways, leave them unlocked with the keys in the ignition. And when we see that, we, you know, tell them they should probably not do that, but a lot of people feel that it's safe enough that they can go ahead and do that in this town, and nothing will happen from doing it. But clearly, we do have auto burglaries, and we do have thefts from automobiles, and every now and then, again, we do have the occasional auto theft where somebody does take someone's car. So, you know, there are things you can do to keep yourself from being a victim, such as taking stuff out of your vehicle, such as making sure your car's locked up, not keeping your keys in your car. You know, the basics could prevent a lot of that. But I think it is important to note, I think the number in Atherton is, is very low compared to Redwood City. Absolutely. In Menlo Park, we did just have one on a walnut that I emailed you about. And, you know, we call those crimes of opportunity. Uh, it's still a crime, but the people are leaving their uh, stuff in the car. What really resonates with people is when we get their attention is by leaving it unlocked, what's typically in the car, the garage door opener, to give you access to the house. Um, and so we do appeal to people, our community meetings, and get it out there to do that. Thank you. Can I ask something about this? Is there any pattern, is there any, like, do they happen late at night? Like, we always hear about hidden runs, and, and surprises me either. Yeah, it surprises me. That just seems like a really bad thing to do. Well, if we look at December, we had a hit and run at 10.27 in the morning on a Sunday. 5.52 in the afternoon on a Friday, and we had uh, one at 3.53 in the afternoon on a Thursday. So, you know, there is no specific time, there is no specific day that they happen. A lot of times a hit and run will happen. They'll get into a collision, and either the person that caused the collision, most likely it's the person that caused the collision, will take off, either because they don't have a driver's license or they don't have insurance. Maybe possibly they're under the influence. Maybe they have a warrant out for their arrest and they're gonna leave before the police show up. Um, what helps us out is if the victim gets a license plate of the car. Because if they get a license plate of the car and we can match the license plate of the car, we'll always follow up on it and try to find these people. Um, if we can't get a license plate and there's absolutely no information on the person, um, we're kind of stuck. There's not a lot we can do unless there would be like significant damage on the car then we can send out a, a BOL or be on the lookout to all the departments. We can send out a track flyer. We can inform everybody around and have them start looking for the car. Um, but if it's a, a, a very minor bumper tap and somebody takes off and there's no damage and there's no license plate, um, a lot of times our hands are tied and we're not going to be able to do anything with those. That was, please, that was not, you know that wasn't a criticism. No, I know. I'm just kind of explaining how and we... And how often do we make an arrest after hit and run? Do we ever, how often do we get the person who did it? You know, so last year, we, we just ran the numbers, and last year we had, I think, just off the top of my mind, 16 or 17 hit and runs. I think 16. And I think we, we, we solved five of them, I believe. Oh, wow. So we did get five of them last year. Right? And I think, you know, it makes a good point. It's when they have the information, the guys are on it, but when we have nothing, we have nothing. And it's unfortunate for the victim, but of course there's insurance involved. But where we do have information, they're aggressive, and we, we are making arrests. Yeah, I can tell you, we had one yesterday at Middlefield and, and Watkins, and it ended up um, being a rental car, and, and we've been doing a lot of follow-up on it. So we know who rented the car. We've got, we have a, a video of him renting the car from LAX. Mm -hmm. We know the car was supposed to be returned last month, and it never was. Um, but the problem is, he's not from this country. So now we're trying to track him down and figure out where he is. So we've got his car, we know who he is, we know who rented the car, but there's nothing in the car with his information, so we're trying to find out who he is. Um, and you said there were 15 or 16 last year. It yeah. seemed to be averaging about three a month, I think, where he just read. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes, there's, you know, sometimes there's two or three, sometimes there's none. It just, it just depends. 
you know, I think if you catch 33% of them, your guys are doing great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we're going to just comment there and commend you on the work. I, I, it's happened in September, but I just want to we, we were, we were, we're in a, while we're building, we're in a rental, and we have, a, we have a security system monitored, and crazy wind storm blew a door open somehow, set the alarm off, and the response time for you guys to get there. We were in San Diego, we got a call from PD saying, and tapping our, our monitoring company called, but you guys were there, and the officers were nice enough to walk with us. I have a great video of the officers coming through the house, you know, two in the afternoon, and, and but it was it was a very quick response time, so it was very nice to Thank you. have a town to respond that well. And then secondly, is we do have the construction going on, and I've learned whenever I go to visit the site, particularly on the weekends, when I go there, I close the gate behind me, because if I leave the gate open, it doesn't take more than about 10 or 15 minutes before there's a, an officer pulling in the driveway at the construction <laughs> site, wondering why the gate's open on the weekend, to <laughs> see if somebody's robbing it or something, so I appreciate the, the level of surveillance that that's good to hear. Well, and, and you, I'm not telling you all anything you don't know. And when I was hired, I was advised, of course, that traffic's our number one complaint. Uh, it's important for you to know that our guys are on it. Um, you see from their productivity, their outputs, the amount of activity that you're doing is good. Our closing picture is relatively low. It's dropped by 21 uh, for 2017. And the commander and I, the sergeants, each month, you know, we're looking at, we're conducting analysis of the collisions, looking for patterns. We're looking at our outputs, so we're constantly focused on what our goals are. In fact, next month we're having a meeting to review our goals, looking at what we want to do for 2018, and uh, they're out there working. I'm, I'm very happy with the productivity that they're doing. Well, you know, I don't know whether you started it when you started, but this idea of parking this police car around town. Oh, no, that was going way before. Yeah. Well, yeah. anyway, I, I, it wasn't in that my part of town too. until you got here. So, <laughs> but I think that's great. I think that's, that's been a, a real positive thing. It's a good tool. And, and the other thing, you know, you talk about signage, the, um, these little radar signs that tell you how fast you're going. I think those are really, I don't know whether people pay attention to them. Have you, have you noticed that in areas where you have those, the, the number of tickets has gone down? Mm. Well, I do know they're good traffic, traffic calming. They at least get the attention. I mean, even from my own experience, when, even when I'm driving, I see I go, oh, I think it's, it's the natural inclination to slow down. So. <laughs> They are effective in those areas, and we're working on getting some other more portable signs that we can move around. Well, um, we did a great job of surviving the Marsh Road rebuilding. Um, are we seeing impacts of the nightmare of the Willow 101? I mean, I, I noticed it myself just because I get in the car, I get in a, a, a lift to go to San Jose Airport, and it directs me to, it directs the drive to Marsh Road. Yet I'm, I'm like, why? Going north on El Camino to get there because it's trying to avoid that. But I was wondering if we're seeing other impacts on the town. Well, you know, during the, during the morning and afternoon, um, Marsh Road is, is Marsh Road sold out. Middlefield Road is sold out. Um, El Camino is sold out. Everything is just everything is impacted. Um, it's very hard to um, it's very hard to get around in the morning. It's very, even during the day, sometimes it's hard to get anywhere during the day in, in the town. If, if, like, if we've got to go from one side of the town to the other, the traffic is much greater than it, than it was, you know, even four or five years ago. Um, and in the mornings and afternoons, it's not uncommon to see you know, the road backed up, especially in the afternoon, backed up from Marsh all the way back to Glenwood. And no accidents or anything. It's just the amount of traffic that the streets are carrying. Yeah, Glenwood, Glenwood on Millfield from 101 at like 430. So, yeah, sold out. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. All right. I think that's it. There's no public comments. So, next meeting on Saturday is the 13th. We'll see everyone there. With that. No other items. We'll move to the next. Thanks, Jim. Enjoy the grandkids.